Hey ladies, I just wanted to share my exciting news. My husband James has been accepted to Harvard Business School. Then email suddenly filled with fear when Julie began suffering mysterious symptoms. I had garbled speech and unable to move my legs and arms and hands. At least I have my MRI done last night. So hopefully I will know more in a week what's going on. One week later, 31-year-old Julie Cowan was dead. But how and why? Turns out that buried in those emails to friends about her wonderful life was a clue to her death. A clue that would go undiscovered for a very long time. Julie Cowan's life story began as a love story on this peaceful Baptist College campus in Missouri, where she met a copper-headed charmer named James Cowan. Layla Wilmore was one of Julie's best friends. She was sending me letters, calling me and telling me, hey, I met this guy, and oh, you know, I don't know what's happening, but I think I'm falling for him. Julie's parents, Nancy and Jack Oldag, were impressed with James, too. I thought he was a very nice, intelligent, witty, fine young fella. Extremely good people skills. I was just amazed, you know, that men 19, 20 years old could be as comfortable talking to strangers as, as he was. Soon, Julie and James married, settling down in Kansas City. I wish sometimes I could clone my husband for some of my girlfriends that are in bad relationships. He is the light of my life. Julie became a nurse, but James never graduated. Instead, he got a job in radio, eventually becoming a popular local personality known by the initials JP. I felt happy and I felt complete and I felt as whole as I could be. He was an ambitious up-and-comer with a sense of style, say colleagues like Tony Messenger and Ellen Shank. You know, JP liked the trappings of success. I mean, he had the, the Rolex and the three-piece suit. I saw him driving a Jaguar. He was a, a, a bigger-than-life sort of character. He was sort of, you know, the one you expected to watch and, and end up at the networks. Although both worked hard, James, branching out from radio to a job in marketing at a company called The Learning Exchange, Julie worried about James's big spending ways. I think every two years he got a different car. And that was an issue with their marriage. Julie didn't think that was necessary for him to drive these fancy, expensive cars. He looked on it as a status symbol, and Julie didn't. Money is always an issue. He married Miss Farm Girl, who came from working her ass off for very little. James works hard, but he dreams hard. Then, in 2004, it seemed all James's dreaming was paying off. Despite not graduating college, James announced he'd managed to get into the ultra-prestigious Harvard Business School. Mr. Cowan, the letter read, I would like to congratulate you on your acceptance to the MBA program. We look forward to seeing you in the yard this fall. Julie had strong Midwest roots, and moving across country back east meant leaving her close family and her friends behind. But she was willing to make that sacrifice for James. So the couple moved to Waltham, Massachusetts, and rented this house on School Street. James had worked out a deal to keep his job at the Learning Exchange while going to Harvard. Julie kept saying over and over, aren't we so lucky that we all married so well? And all was well until eight months after the couple's move to Massachusetts, the Cowan's world turns upside down. She woke up in the middle of the night, and her motor skills were all out of whack and... and slurred speech. Yeah. yeah, and that she couldn't talk right. And she said she woke James up and told her, you need to take me to the hospital. She was in the hospital for three days. After a battery of tests, disturbing news. Julie had a chronic kidney disease, and sometime in the future, she'd need dialysis. But even that could not explain the severity of Julie's symptoms. I'm still in the crisis shock stage. They have not totally ruled out cancer. So I pray that isn't what's going on. I'm sure my illness is scaring James more than he'll let on. I hate seeing the worry on his face. All I can do is wait and think positively. Julie. Then, just two weeks later, Labor Day weekend, James drives Julie back to the emergency room. By the time she sees a doctor, she cannot walk or talk. Back in Missouri, the old dags get a call from James. He, he said Julie was it, had another attack that she was in the hospital again. And how was his demeanor this time? He didn't seem very alarmed. 
A short time later, Julie slips into a coma. Still stumped, doctors now began to suspect a more sinister explanation and test her blood for a toxin called ethylene glycol, commonly found in antifreeze. In high doses, it can cause the exact symptoms Julie Cowan is now suffering. The test comes back positive. By now, the old dags have arrived at the hospital. They told us that they were 100% sure she had ethylene glycol in her system. And could you figure any reason why that would be in her system? And that's what yeah. set my head spinning. I, how could this have happened? But though ethylene glycol poisoning is treatable, it was too late for Julie. We realized that we were going to have to take her off in the life support, and there was no hope. Faced with Julie's imminent death, the old dags make a painful decision to take a trip to the Waltham police station without telling James. And we said, we're just going for a drive. So you weren't telling him you were going to the police? No, absolutely not. In fact, you kind of hid that from him. Yeah, absolutely. Mr. Uh, Old Dag said, uh, I don't understand how this can happen. James and Julie were the only two in the house that day, and I know she didn't do it. Police are about to discover Julie's husband had a secret life. Stay with us. It has been just a few weeks since Julie Cowan died, a mysterious case of ethylene glycol poisoning. Waltham police suspect antifreeze and are deep into their investigation when they get a surprising call from Cowan's landlord. The husband has vanished. Detective John Bailey pays a visit to the home. He had abandoned everything. Big screen TV, brand new furniture, thousands and thousands of dollars worth of property. It was, it was bizarre. James Cowan had headed back to his hometown, Jefferson City, Missouri, and a new job as the host of a radio talk show at KLIK. My wife Julie uh, passed away in September. I came back to Jefferson City. I just decided this is the place where I'm supposed to be. Good to have you back, buddy. Thank you, sir. Party line, 9 o'clock. Around town, James had been telling people two stories about Julie's death. Some, that she died of a tragic illness. Others, that she committed suicide. Either way, James seemed ready to start a new life. He had just started dating somebody, and he seemed to be very interested in kind of settling down and maybe having kids. But close family and friends like Layla and Ted Wilmore knew the real story, that Julie had died of ethylene glycol poisoning. And police were asking a lot of questions about James. He was their prime suspect. We asked him, you know, aren't you a little bit worried about the way things look? And he said, you know, guys, I don't think I would be indicted for this. And if I were indicted, I wouldn't be convicted. It would be a circumstantial case. We knew the case was circumstantial. We did the best we could as far as investigating. Over the following months, police discover a series of disturbing secrets about James, information they were quietly sharing with Julie's parents, who eventually came to the horrifying conclusion their son-in-law might be guilty of killing their only daughter. I asked the detective, I said, do you care if I confront him? And he said, eh, don't. So you took their advice. It's not that we didn't want to. Right. Yeah. We just knew that it would not be a productive thing to do. So the old dags wait. Finally, more than a year after Julie Cowan's death, Detective Bailey travels to Missouri to make a dramatic arrest during the middle of James's radio show. We knew he was on the air. I saw him coming out of his radio booth. Do you know why we're here? And do you know who we are? And James said, I know. What did you think when you heard James had been arrested? I was very, very happy that they finally decided they had enough evidence to bring him to court. Cowan is accused of slowly and methodically poisoning his wife to death behind the closed doors of their supposedly happy home. The charge is first-degree murder, the motive yet to be explained. Guilty or not guilty? Thank you. On one side of the courtroom, Julie's parents. On the other, James's mother, Betty. In the defendant's chair, James sits by calmly as his attorney points out the weaknesses in the prosecution's case. 
There are no eyewitnesses here. There is no physical evidence. There is no confession or admission by James Cowan. He kind of sat there with a halfway grin on his face, thinking that he was probably going to get away with this. With no direct evidence, prosecutors attack James's credibility, starting with his supposed acceptance letter to Harvard Business School. It had looked convincing to Cowan's former boss. I would like to congratulate you on your acceptance to the Harvard Business School MBA program. And it is signed by Britt K. Dewey. Yes, I'm Britt K. Dewey. That is not my signature. The letter was a fake. Turns out, all the time Cowan was supposed to be going to Harvard and working, he was doing neither. I fired JP. Fired after his boss found out about another Cowan deception. He had been stealing money from the company and apparently forged yet another signature on a contract to cover his tracks. It is not my signature. Faced with the prospect of having to tell his wife that he was now accused of fraud, that his job was lost, and that whole story about the Harvard Business School was a big lie, prosecutors say James Cowan was desperate, his house of cards collapsing. Prosecutors say money was the motive, the Cowans were broke, and James hoped to cash in on his wife's $250,000 life insurance policy by killing her. In mid-August, just before Julie became ill, investigators testified someone using James Cowan's computer Googled these terms, homemade poisons, ricin, chloroform poisoning, by arsenic in Boston, and antifreeze human death. Antifreeze which commonly contains ethylene glycol, the poison that killed Julie Cowan. When they showed the number of times he searched on how to poison someone, I think, how many times did he sit down in front of his computer and decide, I'm going to kill my wife? At any one of those times, he could have thought, well, maybe I shouldn't do this. Maybe this is wrong. But he didn't. He just kept searching and searching. Prosecutors say James probably learned online how to mask the sweet taste of antifreeze by mixing it with Gatorade, which is nearly the same color and just as sweet. That's antifreeze on the right and Gatorade on the left. Toxicologist Alphonse Poklis, who specializes in poisoning cases, has actually taste tested the toxic mixture. I took drinks of it. I didn't swallow, but I took drinks and I've swashed it around in my mouth. Ethylene glycol just tasted like Gatorade. This is not the only time someone has been accused of poisoning a spouse with antifreeze. I back in March of 2009, mm -hmm. Stacy Castor, the woman who became known as the Black Widow, was convicted for killing her second husband with antifreeze. And in 2007, Lynn Turner was convicted of poisoning her boyfriend, apparently with Jell-O laced with antifreeze. In both cases, it was later discovered that the women's previous husbands had also died of antifreeze poisoning. Uh, evidence of a person's and in 2008, Kenosha County, Wisconsin DA Bob Jamboys successfully prosecuted Mark Jensen for murdering his wife, Julie, using antifreeze. Jamboys says it's an agonizing death. You start having difficulty breathing, you're, there's a rapid pulse rate, you start vomiting, you become nauseous, you, you become terribly thirsty, and then in the third stage, your kidneys start to shut down. And as your body is shutting down, you're experiencing this terrible, this agonizing, horrible way of dying. It's a terribly sick feeling. And then ultimately, you can become comatose. According to the American Association of Poison Control Centers, in 2007, there were more than 5,700 intentional and unintentional cases of ethylene glycol antifreeze poisoning in the U.S., resulting in 27 deaths. But with so many known cases of antifreeze poisoning, why had Julie Cowan's doctors not caught it earlier? Because Julie had waved them off. The doctors kept asking her, are you sure you aren't getting some kind of poison? She kind of laughed about that and thought it was completely ridiculous. But medical examiner Farrell Sandler, who reviewed Julie Cowan's records, says it's clear she was exposed to the deadly chemical for weeks. Acute and chronic ethylene glycol intoxication. Chronic means over a period of time. Defense lawyers pressure Sandler to admit poisoning is not always homicide. Another possibility would be an accident, and a third possibility would be a suicide. Correct. 
But the expert is convinced Julie, a registered nurse with access to all kinds of drugs, would not kill herself this way. This is not a painless way to die. It didn't make sense that a nurse would put herself through that, a suffering type of extended, long death like this. So could it have been an accident? That seemed to be James's story, and he had two wildly improbable versions of what might have happened. He told some people Julie had gone for a walk the day before she lapsed into a coma and died, and strangely speculated that maybe she had found a Gatorade bottle filled with antifreeze on the street somewhere and then drank it. He also told other people that he actually saw her drinking from a Gatorade bottle. I mean, these stories just, they were just so far-fetched. Police never found antifreeze or Gatorade in the Cowan home. But they knew Julie was drinking the brightly colored energy drink. How? Julie told them in one of those chatty, heartfelt emails to friends. In this case, the co-worker, Jill Lawson. Julie responded, I think today is better. I still have episodes where I feel like my face is going to vibrate off my head. Then, buried in the email, the critical clue. James keeps wanting me to drink Gatorade, and my taste buds just can't handle anything citric. There it was, from Julie herself, James encouraging her to drink Gatorade. It was like Julie was there talking about it, and she thought he was taking care of her, and he was doing just the opposite. On the outside, he portrayed himself as a caring, loving husband, and the cruelty that goes with a slow, poisoning death I found that, that very, very cold. The final witness read one of Julie's last emails. As she is drifting towards death, Julie writes not of concern about herself, but of her unending love for James, a man she has no idea may be killing her. My husband is a wonderful person, going on eight years of marriage in September. He is going to school at Harvard and working full time, so his plate is pretty full. I don't want my illness to mess that up for him. Hope to talk with you soon, Julie Keon. Closing arguments. He prevented this. He chose this extremely cruel way to kill her. This couple loved and cared for each other. Julie herself said as much in her emails. James Cowan is not guilty. The verdict and words you rarely hear from the mouth of a judge. Stay tuned. Jefferson City's new station. The fate of former Jefferson City radio host James Cowan in the hands of a jury today. The local stations are all abuzz. The man everyone thought was a great guy had turned out to be a con man. James Cowan had lied about going to Harvard, been fired for stealing, was broke and sliding deeper into debt. Instead of simply confessing to his wife, prosecutors say he killed her in the most painful of fashions to collect on her life insurance. In the courtroom, James's mother and Julie's parents wait for a verdict. It doesn't take long. Less than two days for the jury to decide. What say you? Is the defendant guilty or not guilty? Guilty. First degree. Murder with deliberate premeditation. James's mother, Betty, his only courtroom supporter, sits alone, listening as the judge says there will be no delay. All right, you may proceed. She will sentence Cowan that very day first giving Julie's parents a chance to finally confront their son-in-law. In my mind, James is no longer a person. He is just a mass of flesh and bone taking up space on this earth. A real person would never have done such an evil thing. Thank you. And then a surprise, something judges rarely do. Along with the sentence, Sandra Hamlin looks down from the bench and personally lets James have it. The way in which this defendant secretly and methodically planned and carried out the poisoning of his wife and allowed her to suffer so horribly and die such a slow and painful death makes this court feel that I am truly in the presence of an evil person. The defendant would please rise. The sentence of James Cowan, life in prison. 
The sentencing may have brought a feeling of justice to Julie's parents, but now they want a change to antifreeze so others don't suffer the same fate. I just don't understand why it has to have such a sweet taste to the extent that it can be mixed in with sweet drinks and not know, and it can be put in there and people don't know that it's there. I think it's a very dangerous substance out there that needs to be fixed. A number of states have enacted legislation requiring the addition of a substance to antifreeze that makes it taste bitter. But that's all too late to help Julie Cowan, who leaves behind family and friends still devastated by her death and shaken by the betrayal from the man she thought loved her so much. He has ruined so many lives. He took her life and robbed us of her, but he's ruined his own life in the process. I think that it was meticulous, it was calculated. It is mind-boggling. I, I think that he is a broken person. I see him as a broken person. This guy deceived us so badly and so easily, you know. And now I can look back and I can say, I should have seen this and this and this. I didn't check up on it. Mm. Julie was such a good person. It, you know, it wasn't like he was married to someone who didn't care about him. She would have went to the ends of the earth for anything he wanted. Loved him till the end. Till the end.